Hello and welcome to Wood Pods, the podcast designed to share sporting experience and knowledge to instill passion within the NLCS Dubai community on behalf of Team NLCS. Today I am both excited and honoured to be joined by Paralympian and world champion wheelchair fencer Dimitri Kutcher. Following an international call-up at just 14 years old, Dimitri broke through on the international stage with a bronze medal win in the foil at the World Cup in Hungary. In 2015, at age just 17, Dimitri progressed to win five World Cup medals in both the foil and the EPE event and a silver medal in the foil at the 2015 World Championships. Ahead of securing his first Paralympic call-up for GB in 2016, Dimitri won both a silver in the foil and a bronze in the EPE event at the European Championships. At the Paralympic Games in Rio, just aged 18, Dimitri proceeded to the quarter-final stages in both the foil and the EPE events. Since Rio, Dimitri has achieved double world gold in both EPE and foil in 2017, and subsequently he became the European EPE champion in 2018. Just to top it off, in 2019, Dimitri was crowned world champion in the EPE event in Korea. Welcome, Dimitri. How did it all start? How did fencing become your life? Well, uh, I was first introduced to it in primary school, um, or I experienced it at kind of a, a summer camp that we got taken to. And then when I joined St. Benedict's, uh, I took it up as a games option there. And I had some very helpful uh, staff there who really, you know, really went out of their way to, to make sure I was in, included in it and was getting the best possible experience from it. Uh, I believe Father Thomas actually bought me a frame, which was, you know, so kind of him. Uh, and I had some co- some fantastic coaches there, one of whom was I worked with for many years. Uh, and yeah, they helped me kind of like develop my passion and my interest in it. Fantastic. And for the listeners who are not familiar with fencing, what's the difference between epe, foil and sabre? So uh, in fencing, foil, epe and sabre are the names given to the three disciplines, uh, I guess you'd call it. Um, able-bodied fences will specialise in one uh, weapon. Uh, each of these are different events, so you'd have a foil day and an epi day and a sabre day. Wheelchair fences also tend to excel in one area, but for the most part, um, but they will do a second weapon, uh, except for a few individuals. Uh, and the difference between these weapons are the sizes of them, the weight, uh, how you hold them, uh, where you hit. So for foil, the target area is just the torso, so it's the front and the back. Um, Epe and Sabre include the arms and head as target area as well. Can you briefly mm-hmm. describe how you became involved in the sport and, and competition? Because obviously being involved in school is quite low level and then suddenly you launched through to the competition scene. How did that happen? Yes, exactly. Um, so obviously, as I mentioned, I've been doing it. I had been doing it at school for, for a couple of years. And uh, in fact, I almost lost interest in it because I, I, I didn't realise just how big the wheelchair fencing scene was and I wasn't I didn't have access to competitions um, but again Matthew Gale and John Sloman who were coaches at the school uh, found a competition for me to, to, to take part in which was the UK school games uh, back in 2011 so I went and I did that and there were talent coaches there who were working with the London squad uh, and they invited me to come and train with said squad and some other people one of whom is a very good friend of mine now um, and uh, yeah, I trained with that squad for, for a year and that's kind of like where the passion grew and that dream of hopefully being a Paralympian was, was starting to solidify. Fantastic. And a lot of our listeners may be wondering how you train for fencing and how does this differ for both the technical and the strength and conditioning side um, and how this differs between fencing and wheelchair fencing. So obviously you've got the obvious differences. Fencing, able-bodied fencing is very much a, a sport centered around footwork and speed and agility of, or rather well, ability to change direction quickly coming from the legs. Wheelchair fencing, not so much. We're in a seated position, although the movement isn't stationary. We, we lean forwards and backwards in and out of the chair at quite, quite very high speeds. Um, the technical training, I, I do a lot of, um, uh, sparring with other fencers. Uh, I have technical lessons with, with coaches where we practice moves, etc. Uh, and yeah, gym and cardio three times a week. Fantastic. And whilst you were at school, you managed to do your A-levels alongside the demands of training and competing 
for GB. So can you just describe for me what this was like, how many hours a week you did for training and how you managed your time? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was an interesting time because for me it was, well, on the one hand, quite stressful, but also was quite fulfilling because I felt like I was working towards two big aspects of my life, my education um, and hopefully qualifying for a Paralympics. Um, it was difficult to manage uh, and I couldn't have done it without the support of very understanding coaches and teachers at the school. Um, you know, they were very understanding and, and helped me to, to kind of catch up on what I'd missed and devoted a lot of time to that. And I'd take train, uh, sorry, I'd take work with me to training, uh, to competitions and try and do what I could when I could and always made sure I had the time to try and catch up uh, on anything that I'd missed after I'd returned from these um, uh, from, 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 from these training uh, situations and, and competitions. I think I was doing roughly six hours a day of training in the run up to Rio. Um, so managing that would have been impossible on my own. So I, I do have to say a big thank you to St. Benedict's and all the coaches that were with me during that time. And when did the penny drop that you could finally represent GB at the Paralympic Games? Hmm. I think I'd, I'd always been hopeful, you know, it's been a dream of mine for a long time to compete uh, and hopefully to win a games. Um, but I didn't know what sport and for, for, for many years until I started fencing and then I felt this was the one that I wanted to commit my time to. But I think the moment when I realised it really was possible, when I first had evidence that it was possible, would have been my first gold medal at an individual competition back in Canada in 2015. Um, I encountered many opponents who I really respect and who are really competitive and I still have the honour of being competitive with them to this day uh, and it felt like one of those days that everything just felt right, kind of clicked into place and I fenced, I, I felt I fenced really well and that gold was like the first milestone in my head um, and it was wonderful to have, again, my supportive coaches, my teammates and my, my lovely mother who was also there. Um, yeah, I think that was the first, I'd say that was the first um, quite, what's the word, real experience that I had of this was possible. Okay, so you went on to make your Paralympic debut in Rio in 2016 at the very young mm -hmm. age of 18. I remember seeing you yeah. on the screen during the opening ceremony and it was an emotional moment for all of us, I think, who knew how hard you had worked to be selected. How did you prepare for such a major event and what did you learn from this experience? It was an incredible experience. Um, it took me a while to fully digest it, especially because for me personally, Rio didn't actually go as well as I was dreaming or hoping it could have done. Um, I, I did a lot of intense physical preparation, especially because I'd been taking a lot of time out of training to do my exams because there was, a, I can't remember how long the period of prep was, probably close to two months of exams as, as most people do. Um, so I, I, I did try and make up for it after that. That, that period had finished. I made some mistakes, it, it, you know, it wasn't perfect, uh, but again, I was, I was quite young and I've learned from, from those experiences. What I did take from Rio was that kind of experience of being in a Paralympic Games, because it is unlike anything anyone has done before. You know, if you talk to any athlete and ask them about their World Cups, World Championships, whatever competition they've done, nothing compares to the Games. Maybe not as big in number as competitions, definitely not as big in number for, for us, but, um, yeah, the atmosphere is unlike anything we'd ever experienced. Um, and I don't think I was fully prepared for that. But now uh, I've taken the lessons from that and uh, I've tweaked them to help with my preparation for Tokyo, which is now next year. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's my take back from it. I, I tried to enjoy the things I, I really liked in Rio, such as the atmosphere, the opening ceremony, um, always special, especially for a first games. What role did your family play in particular to help you achieve such success? I mean, I always say, like, it's tricky, but I think everyone who gets somewhere does have a really good support network, be it from their family, from their friends, from their coaches. I've been very fortunate and had support from all three areas. So I really do owe my friends and my family everything. I could not have done what I've done so far without them. Uh, they drove. They drove me everywhere. They 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 helped financially support all this for years. Um, you know, they're they're honestly so incredible and so understanding. Uh, even my my younger brother, you know, he could have been 
could have taken the kind of like disruption that we tried to keep to a minimum in, in all fairness but he could have reacted to it very differently to how he did but he's been very chilled very supportive and you know he's just been fantastic as as of the rest of my family so i really do owe, the, owe them everything and i can't thank them enough there's research to indicate that often athletes secure their best olympic performance after their first olympic debut so what edge do you think your previous paralympic experience will give you and how will this help you prepare to, to, to make sure that you can continue your success? Like I said, I think the combination of it being the first games and experiencing that new environment for the first time was, uh, I wasn't fully prepared for, but I've, I've basically taken those lessons and, and that atmosphere and, and I've incorporated it and, and tried to like uh, learn uh, from that experience as much as possible. Um, and uh, honestly, I can say we're, we're doing everything that we can now to, to, to try and secure those gold medals in Tokyo. How has becoming a world champion given you performance confidence? World champs, even though it's not the same as the Games, again, as I mentioned before, it's probably the closest competitive environment that you're going to be able to get before uh, you compete at the Games. So my, f not my first world champs, rather, my, the first time I won uh, a world championships title was back in 2017. Um, that for me, again, uh, it, it kind of like another bit of evidence. Uh, so that first gold in, in Canada, and I've been fortunate enough to win a few more medals uh, between that and, and the world champs. So, you know, this was all building the confidence, but the world, that world champs win was a firm reminder to me that what we're doing is working. Uh, and as long as I kind of stick with the process um, and, and continue to adapt to, to face the challenges that training and my opponents will, will continue to give me that I'm being, putting myself in the best possible position to, to win uh, a games, which is the goal of pretty much most of the athletes that, that are competing and, and, and dreaming of such a thing. Okay, great. Now, just returning to Tokyo, many professional athletes uh, like yourself have spent the last four years preparing to ensure that they are competing at their best for this summer um, in, in, the, in the Paralympic Games that were due to take place in Tokyo. So how do you feel about the Tokyo Paralympics being postponed till next summer? And what approach are you taking to ensure that you can stay fully motivated to peak again in 12 months time? It's, I mean, this is a weird situation. Everyone will know. It's, I don't think many of us envisioned something quite like this happening so quickly. Um, all I can say is that the response to this has been absolutely bang on. I can completely understand and support the decision of supporting the games because people's health and well-being uh, come before anything else, um, and not just the athletes, but the, the thousands of people that were going to travel uh, to, to come and to come and watch their games. And I don't think it's really the Olympics and the Paralympics without that kind of feeling of community and safety. So I fully support that decision to to to, to postpone it, uh, and I trust that you know, the right decisions are being made. Uh, in terms of the preparation, again, I'm very fortunate to have a really good support network. I have to thank Team Bath because they've been incredible and understanding. UK Sports, similarly, uh, they provide those kind of like facilities uh, and, and that um, support that we need to, to continue training to the best that we can be. Um, and this change has been disruptive and it's been very challenging for many people for obvious reasons, but I can you know, I, I have complete faith that uh, all of us working together will, will, will continue to make the best out of this situation. Brilliant, thank you. Now, you mentioned Team Bar. This is obviously mm -hmm. where the GB wheelchair fencing programme takes place from. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about the programme there? Yes, so it's basically a, a centralised uh, centre where uh, we have our head coach, Peter Rome, working with uh, me, which is two days a week there, and with my teammate Piers Gilliver, who also trains there um, uh, full time. Uh, we've recently had some new additions to 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 the team, and we've been all training there on a on a fairly consistent basis. And yeah, that that uh, that kind of atmosphere that Team Bath provides us with that, you know, the feeling of us having everything that we need in one space is a really good. Um, way of promoting a performance kind of like lifestyle and atmosphere and that that closeness that we have really allows us to kind of challenge each other to, to be better than than we currently are and that process is a big part in the in how we're preparing for tokyo 
So you're at Team Bar for two days a week. How does the rest of the week map out in terms of your training? So uh, I drive to and from Bath on the Wednesday and Friday, and the rest of the time I train in clubs uh, based around my home area in London. And I work with two personal coaches who work in close conjunction with the head coach, so that uh, when I'm when I'm at home. But on heavy days, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, I do about seven hours, um, and then Thursdays, Fridays is a minimum uh, of four hours plus whatever training camps that we may have on the weekends. Uh, so. Yeah, it's it's not always one hundred percent fixed, but it's it's always the right amount to to ensure that we're getting as much uh, progression as possible. So it's effectively a full time job plus competition and uh, training events. Yeah, exactly. I think it has to be if you want to be uh, as competitive as you possibly can be. Okay, and a lot of our listeners will wonder how you fund yourself. So can you just just, just describe the sort of the outline of that? So UK Sport provides us with the money that we need and. In turn, that money helps us to basically gather everything that we need to, to, to compete on a very competitive uh, basis with with the rest of the world. And the money that comes from uh, that, the money that UK Sport gives us comes from the people who play the national lottery. And I'd like to take uh, a second to thank them as well for for playing because this this wouldn't be possible without without their support. Basically, um, so thank you guys. This it really is a great thing that you're doing. You were crowned world champion in 2019. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, what does the cancellation of the Paralympics mean for you in terms of qualification for Tokyo? Are there now other events that you've got to prove yourself at for requalification? How, how's this going to work? Uh, to be honest, I've got no idea because this is such an ever-changing situation. Um, all I can say is I trust that the national and international bodies involved in that uh, involved in that decision making process are going to make the decision that they feel is the right decision and all we can do really is wait to see and find out and see how the situation plays out um for us not a lot has changed it's the same goal it's just been moved back a year so if anything we've got more time to prepare and try and make it the best games possible well po very positive approach to have so at nlcs we have a term which we use which is set only floors not ceilings and in terms yes. of our students stretching their own potential and abilities what wise words could you share with our listeners to help aspire them to develop their sporting passion a lot of people have asked me this question and i find that the common thing to try and remember through all of it is that it's never an easy job but anyone who's good at something started in the same place not knowing anything about what it is that they're doing um be it sport academia whatever it is you, you you you're not born or you don't suddenly exist with the knowledge on how to be competitive in that field so if you think it's impossible it really isn't uh, you just need to kind of take the time take that sacrifice take that effort and and, and motivation for the power for for whatever it is that you're passionate about um, and I really like that part of the, the motto that you just said, basically, don't set a ceiling because there's no need to set a ceiling because I, if you'd asked me before I had the stream whether or not I'd be competing at games, I don't think I'd have answered the same way. But it's, it is possible, you know, I've, I've fortunately managed to do it. I still got a lot to learn and a lot to improve and a lot to try and achieve. Um, I haven't made it by any stretch, but I'm a lot further than I, than I thought I would be if you'd asked me as a child. Um, so, and the same goes for, for everyone here. If you, you know, commit to that thing and give that sacrifice, you'll, Absolutely. you'll do more than you thought you could do. Absolutely. Better never stops, as we say. Exactly. Yes. Now, obviously you're, you're pretty young in your sporting career, we hope, but what's been your best sporting memory so far? And going back to that World Championships in 2017 in Italy, uh, for me, uh, I'm never going to forget that. That first kind of feeling of winning a major championship title, because um, I'd been close to it before at the Europeans, but had, had just missed out. But that win, though, that goal, and not only that, just one, but but fortunately managing to 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 make it a double with that support of the team, um, it was just spectacular. The whole emotions of of that weekend were crazy. Where well, the first day, where it seemed to go pretty smoothly throughout, uh, except for maybe a couple of wobbly points and. 
that kind of it didn't hit me at first when I scored that last point, and then it all kind of rushed in at once. Uh, and that sense of joy, basically, I was you know living off it basically for for a few weeks after that, um, and then going straight into the second day of competition, less than twenty four hours after that initial initial win, um, the final was so intense, probably the most intense one that I've I've, I've ever had. Where, uh, I was fencing an Italian fencer in a, in a home crowd situation and um, being down three points, I think, and my opponent only had to score one more to win. It's a match to 15, and uh, he was winning 14-11 or 12, potentially. Uh, and I managed to score three hits in a row and kind of that feeling of almost just, yeah, just scraping through, but realizing again that I'd managed to do it again was just uh, elating, basically. <laughs> Absolutely, truly deserved. What are you looking forward to the most? I think right now I'm looking forward to this situation being put back into a bit of sense of normality and uh, and people feeling healthy and safe again. And through that, then we can start to think about getting back into training and getting back to working towards, well, what I've been working towards since I started fencing nearly, well, over 10 years ago now. Um, just. Paralympic preparation and so Tokyo yeah is always going to be that kind of goal for me and after Tokyo it's going to be Paris uh, and it's going to be similar for for many other people out there and I'm looking forward to getting back to competing with competitors and friends at the same time. Thank you for your time today Dimitri you will be a huge inspiration to our listeners particularly with what you have achieved in your young life whilst at school juggling the demands of academics alongside preparing for your debut Paralympic performance. I know you will have gained a few more supporters from this podcast and the NLCS community will be watching your progress towards Tokyo in 2021. Good luck for the future, and we look forward to watching you next summer. And who knows, you might be on the podium, and the children will recognise you and cheer for you for sure. You can follow Dimitri Kutcher at... I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My Facebook name is Dimitri Kutcher GBR. That's my official athlete page. My Instagram is Dimitri Kutcher, all one word, all lowercase. And my Twitter handle is dkutia, capital D, capital C. Thank you so much for listening, guys. And I really hope it was helpful. And thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Woodrum, for, for inviting me and for your continued support. I will never forget everything that you managed to do for me to, to help me with this. Absolute, absolute pleasure, Dimitri. We will see you very soon. Take care. Thank Bye you very now. much. Bye. Next week on WoodPods, we will be reconnecting with Bermudan Paralympian athlete Jessica Lewis. You may remember we met Jessica at NLCS in 2019 while she was in Dubai for the World Para Championships. Jessica has made history for Bermuda multiple times, most recently by winning two Parapan American Games titles at Lima in 2019. Stay tuned to hear the latest from Jessica next Wednesday. Thanks for listening.